But then when you drop that and you truly let go, um, there's a complete freedom from any kind of mental negativity, freedom from suffering, freedom from any kind of mental agitation. Um, and so that's when you're in, you, you fall into this kind of blissful enlightenment like state when you. Okay, today's guest is Dr. James Cook, who's a neuroscientist, writer, and speaker focused on consciousness, meditation, psychedelic states, and science. He studied experimental psychology and completed his PhD in neuroscience at Oxford University. Dr. Cook holds research positions at University College London and Trinity College Dublin, where he investigates how the brain creates our experience of the world. He was a really fascinating person to speak to if you're interested in any of these subjects regarding psychedelics, meditation, consciousness. I think you'll love this one. Without further introduction, here is Dr. James Cook. All right, James, uh, thanks for coming on the FitMind podcast. Hey, you're very welcome. Very happy to be here. So where does your story begin? How do you, how do you first get interested in studying the mind and brain? Yeah, so I... Um... It begins when I was, I'd say when I was about 13, I was um, raised Catholic and like a lot of kids at that age, I was kind of starting to question it. Um, and, but I was, instead of questioning it in a way where I was like rebelling against it, I was kind of overly conscientious and I took it all a bit too seriously. And one day I was on the bus to school and I was, um, I was really upset and worrying about the prospect of hell and the idea that like, I could just go to, to hell for not having blind faith in a God. And so even then I was kind of like a scientific skeptical kind of person, but I was told there was this God that I had to believe in, but I just didn't have this blind faith. And I was like, how could this supposedly benevolent creator create me without blind faith and then insist that I have it and then punish me forever for not having it. And I just, I couldn't figure out a way out of this because I couldn't just force myself to have blind faith. And I got really stressed and I, I kind of got stressed to a point where my mind went blank. It just kind of stopped thinking because I, I couldn't, yeah, I guess I thought all the thoughts and I couldn't think anymore. And then I had this moment that was a real classical kind of, the kind of experience people often aim for in, in meditation, although you're not supposed to aim, but um, the kind of mental state of just empty mind, just this this blissful, peaceful collision with the present moment. And it was one of the most profound experiences of my life. And really, uh, from then on, my I would say, well, this is this is something incredibly profound, incredibly important um, in understanding our place in the world. And it felt really, it felt completely naturalistic. It felt like I'd seen a, a truth. It didn't feel like I'd come into contact with some spiritual realm or anything, anything supernatural or weird. I felt like I just gained a deep insight into the mind. Um, and so then I could have gone off and kind of studied Buddhist philosophy or something like that, but I was kind of scientifically inclined and I went and studied psychology or experimental psychology, which is kind of all based in scientific experiments. So no Freud, no <laughs> dream analysis, nothing like that. Um, and then I got exposed to kind of just the brain and sensory processing and, and neural circuitry and all the real hard science of understanding the brain. And then I, I went down that route for my master's and PhD. And I've been working since then as a neuroscientist, uh, but I've always had this kind of interest in things like meditation and um, altered states, who's kind of psychedelics and the kind of insights people have into the nature of the mind in those states. Um, but I'm always coming at it from this like naturalistic scientific perspective. Uh, so yeah, that that's kind of where it all began. Great. Yeah. And we'll dig into a lot of that science in a minute, but I want to focus back on this experience that you had. And I think it can sound just strange or hard to wrap your mind around for someone who hasn't had that glimpse. And uh, do you think you could maybe point out this non-dual nature of consciousness or this, this non-dual experience that you had and how someone listening to this right now might begin to glimpse this as a you know, a fundamental fact of kind of how their mind works. Right. Yeah. So yeah, you articulated it in the right way there that it's, it's a feature of the mind that's present for all of us. It's not something you have to acquire or cultivate. It's just there. Um, but we tend to not see it because there's a lot of momentum in our behind us in our kind of mental 
patterning that leads us to being distracted and thinking about other things and not um, not noticing this. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'll try and point it out. And for some listeners, it may they may actually just it may work. For a lot of people, though, it probably won't, and they just it won't. Nothing will really change in their experience. Um, but it is very possible to notice it immediately. So the it usually feels like you are a self, a, a kind of a being existing in a world. We we feel like we see through our experience to a world beyond, and there's this this familiar world of, of everyday objects, and I'm in the middle of it. Um, but then in this experience, what happens is you realize that, or it's not a kind of intellectual realization, but you just appreciate that actually all of this, my hands that I'm looking at right now, the table in front of me, all of it is appearing equally in awareness or consciousness or whatever word you want to use in the mind. Um, and when, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost so simple. It's hard to see, uh, this is not making any claim about, you know, um, a, a physical body still exists and that's still different to the, the environment around, but consciousness is a bit like a simulation that this organism is running. And it does this weird trick where even though, all of the kind of pixels in the simulation, if you want, are the same. It's like some of them are designated me and some of them are designated the environment. So it's a bit like a kind of video game where even though you're looking at a flat two-dimensional screen, you you get this impression that you are the character and the environment is separate. Um, so that's how, kind of how the mind is structured. And when you're in that mode, you're 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 differentiating between self and other to protect yourself fundamentally. That's why this evolved. Um, so it's a mode of kind of self-protection, but then when you drop that and you truly let go, um, there's a complete freedom from any kind of mental negativity, freedom from suffering, freedom from any kind of mental agitation. Um, and so that's when you're in, you, you fall into this kind of blissful enlightenment, like state when you can just truly be aware of everything that arises just as something arising in consciousness. Um, and yeah, when it happened to me. You know, nothing, I mean, what happened to me the first time, nothing dramatically changes in your experience. It's not like you suddenly have these psychedelic visuals or hallucinations or anything, um, or, you know, merging with a white light or anything like that. Everything looks the same, except you're kind of, you're really intimately connected with the present moment, connected with whatever's really happening to you right now. You're not thinking about it. You're not thinking about the future or the past. You're just present. Um, and when you're when you're immersed in the present that much, the past falls away, the, the future falls away, the kind of mental activity that, you know, when we're thinking about the past and the future. And so you're, you're just, you come into alignment with whatever is in the present. And that's, you know, things you're sensing and whatever's arising in consciousness. Um, yeah, and you realize it's all just the same arising in the same space. And there's this freedom that comes with that. Right. So just to restate a lot of what you just said, the feeling of being a little mini me in the head somewhere looking out from behind the eyes is a mental construct. And even the feeling of being, even your feeling of a head is appearing in consciousness, in the same awareness as your hands and as the world around you. So it's kind of this shift from feeling like that little self in the head somewhere to recognizing that there's a broader field of awareness within which all the, your six senses are appearing in each moment. And, um, and, and then the, the ego or this feeling of being a self, you describe it as a, or it's not, you know, it's, it's commonly, um, now understood to be a psychological defense mechanism do you think you could explain why is it that we have this dualistic experience of the world if if it creates so much suffering for ourselves, if it's always creating stories that bring us into the future and past that really uh, cause a lot of unnecessary mental suffering? You know, why does the brain play this nasty trick on us? <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm glad you unpacked it again there as well. And it's, it's kind of worth doing again in as I answer your question, which is, to say that, you know, when we say things like a broader field of awareness, we're not, again, we're not making any kind of claims about 
what's going on outside of the organism and and, and you know and the way it constructs its mind so so you, you have in this picture you have you know the physical world made of the stuff that physics says it's made of you have an organism that functions the way biology says um and then you have a mind that comes into existence with that organism and then there's this this second sense of self that you're alluding to there where you know the james that i feel myself to be my real sense of self is not exactly the same thing as my body as you said i feel like i'm in my head i don't feel like i am every inch of my body i feel like i'm i'm more in my head than i am in my feet for example um and that's where we're we're that's the self that we're in, we're kind of interrogating we're not interrogating the bodily self but we're the psychological self and right now you and i are wearing headphones and if you have over ear headphones that kind of push on your head and you can feel the pressure one way to explore this is usually you feel like you're inside that pressure like you know the you're you're being squeezed by the headphones but what you can realize is as you say that that sensation is also appearing in consciousness and so you can kind of once you've got this insight you can toggle between feeling like you're between the headphones to feeling like you are the spacious awareness in which your head appears the headphone pressure appears the sound of a bird appears and that's you know sometimes when people have these insights it's something like that you know there could be a sound of a bird that's 100 meters away and but you realize that your mind even though physically that is gen, you know it is 100 meters away your mind is in kind of consciousness it's giving you an impression of distance that that's a kind of a simulation of that distance and actually it's right here the sensation is right here it's as in as much in consciousness as sensations on my skin are um so you can have this kind of collapsing of depth uh into this feeling of spacious awareness in which everything appears um so what yeah so why don't we just live in this lovely enlightened state where we're completely non-attached and we don't care what arises in consciousness we're undisturbed and just in this peaceful um state uh and i mean this is this is why i think science is incredibly useful because in a lot of spiritual traditions there's this there's this kind of anti-materialism where it's like what you know what we are in nat- in our essence is this enlightened soul or or whatever it is this enlightened consciousness and we're kind of somehow trapped in this material awful world where we suffer and once we die we'll return to that white light or whatever um to me yeah if that's the picture then i don't understand why we don't all just collectively decide to you know if we agreed that was what was going on we may as well end the process of being trapped here and go to the afterlife so to me that the naturalistic scientific picture gives you a better explanation which is we are this process this activity of of nature um and it just so happens that in our world in our universe we know that change in our universe is governed by something called the second law of thermodynamics which is that fundamentally what's happening in reality is everything was bunched together at the big bang and highly ordered and there was this explosion this release of energy and gradually everything's falling into a state of disorder so we're moving from order to disorder and you can see this this process happening when you add something like cream to coffee you have a highly ordered state where you've got the cream over here and the coffee over there then you mix them and it's moving towards a state of disorder where it's all completely mixed up but in between you get complexity you get these kind of amazing fractal spirals that happen in the coffee um and that's effectively where we're located in reality where you have this transition from high order to low order you know something like the sun the sun's energy is it's radiating kind of order going to disorder and as a result we're catch we're kind of catching that energy and channeling it through us like a whirlpool and by by kind of riding that wave of the dispersal of the energy um we can exist we so this is the kind of thermodynamics of life we we're effectively little um survival machines that that function to kind of channel energy through us um and so so why should we be survival machines well in a world that's falling apart the only thing you really can be is a survival machine you you have to actively perpetuate yourself to survive in this situation everything else just falls apart so we're fundamentally doing a dance of self propagation or survival and that involves a psychology that centered around differentiating yourself from the environment so you can keep yourself together 
Um, if you didn't do that, you'd be the same as a rock in the ocean and you'd just wear away and mix in with everything else. But instead, for the time that we we're alive, you know, ultimately it's a losing game because we, we meld with everything when we die. But for a time, we managed to keep our order together. Um, and this is the same, you know, the reason behind this is the same thing as Darwin's insight around natural selection, which is this kind of tautological reasoning where it's like, you know, animals that are good at surviving, they're the ones that survive. That was kind of, you know, Darwin's insight, um, which can sound trivial, but then you realize, oh, so that's why, um, that's why we eat and that's why birds fly. And that's why we, you know, we can, um, survive in our, in our niche in these different ecosystems because of this dance of survival. And it's the same thing with life itself. Um, it's just this, this activity of self-propagation. Um, but the good thing is, is when you're, when you're looking at the world through the perspective of the organism, you, it really feels like it's important that you survive because that's just, it's your nature. It's what you are. But then if you consider the perspective from outside of your, your own perspective and you say, well, actually it's not, uh, you know, when I die, there's not, that's not going to be some moral tragedy from the perspective of the universe. I am going to die. And, you know, that as, as a, a kind of a, a survival machine, that's something I'd like to delay, but objectively it's not a problem. And so when you drop the psychology of a self, you can really get into this, this non-attached way of being where you're, you're far more accepting of inevitabilities like death. Um, and so, so we just we're very lucky that there are ways to get out of our, um, you know, our way of seeing the world. It's it's not uh, it's not written into the laws of the universe that death is bad. It's only bad from our perspective. And this is where you get into things like um, mystical experiences that are induced through psychedelics can can heal fear of death. Um, you know, help people who have terminal cancer, who have anxiety and depression, uh, because they get this insight. They they physiologically by giving them the substance they're taken into these mystical experiences similar to the one that I had um and they have these kinds of insights and they realize that they were they were too stuck in their survival programming and they realize okay it's just programming when you're in it you feel like it's the most important thing in the universe but when you can psychologically step outside of it that's that's really profoundly liberating for folks who are unfamiliar with a lot of these concepts or haven't listened to previous episodes of the podcast, a lot of this project of meditation um, and of other methods like psychedelics are ways of essentially getting, getting outside of that survival mode that can cause so much mental friction and, you know, getting a view of, of this kind of fundamental nature of the mind that you experienced when you were 13. So, so going back to your story, so you have this experience from a first person subjective vantage point, and then you go on later to study the neuroscience. And I'm curious what you found, how your understanding of the brain might've, uh, you know, backed up your experience or what you might've learned from studying it from a objective point of view. Right. Um, yeah. So, there's, I mean, there's now a kind of a small, you know, number of, of people who are interested in this overlap between things like Buddhist philosophy and, and neuroscience. But when I was doing my, my studying, this was not mainstream. I guess it still isn't mainstream. Um, and I remember as an undergraduate, a lot of the things I was being taught, you know, lectures would end with things like, I remember one where the lecturer was saying like, you know, we're trying to find this, the self in the brain, the, the kind of the CEO that gives the messages that, that kind of directs the free will, makes the decisions, and you can't find it. You, you think it's going to be in the kind of frontal cortex somewhere, but it turns out there is no, no self that's sending the, the messages. And they were, they were, the kind of end of the lecture was like this baffled, like, huh, like, what are we to make of that? But I was sitting there like, well, of course there is no self. Of course there's no, you know, um, top down free will self, you know, self with free will that makes decisions. Everything is just this bottom up unfolding process. Uh, and I felt that with deep, deep conviction, I felt like I'd seen that with my own eyes in this mystical experience, but that's also what science tells us. Um, so it allowed me to really, I think it, I think it gave me a, an edge when it came to understanding the neuroscience of just understanding neuroscience in general, because 
it, it's kind of um, these perspectives are very similar to kind of complexity theory, where you're looking at how complex systems operate. Uh, so if you come in with a folk psychology of, oh, well, I'm a self and I live in my head and I make decisions, that can really limit you in, in understanding the brain. But if you come in with this bottom-up complexity science kind of way of thinking, that can really can really help. And in recent years, there's been a kind of, or in decade in recent decades, really, there's been this gradual trend um, in a minority of of, uh, of neuroscientists to, you know, most neuroscientists are in this paradigm where they think of the brain as like a computer, as something that has kind of symbolic representations it performs computations on them processes information and that's a useful model for for the brain but another way of thinking about uh the brain is in this picture of that i was describing earlier of life being this kind of thermodynamic adaptive process and the brain is purely secondary to the life process it only exists to support life it exists to help us survive and navigate in the world um, and this shouldn't come as a surprise, right? When you think of what your organs do, your lungs help you breathe in order to survive. Your heart pumps blood in order to, to help you survive. When we get to the brain, we do this weird thing and we say, well, the brain is me and I make decisions and I'm in control of my body. So we, we somehow, in, the, in this kind of folk psycho psychological way, elevate the brain and we forget that it's, it's secondary to the life process. Um, but there are more and more people thinking about it now as as something in, in kind of in support of, of, of life. Um, and I would say for me, like that perspective really, it really resonated with me, I think because of this early experience where from that point on, I never felt like there was a self in my head that made decisions. I never felt like free will exists. Um, and I'm not bothered by that. I think it's a good thing. It doesn't exist. You know, Decision-making still exists, but not some free will where you're the true kind of cause of, of your decisions. Um, yeah, and so it gave me a lot of personal liberation from other from mental suffering that might have otherwise occurred. Uh, you know, like when you believe in free will, you can really beat yourself up for things you did in the past, decisions you made. But when you realize there's no free will, you can just kind of learn from your mistakes and understand why you did what you did, that it arose from causes and you're not really the, the ultimate cause of it. Um, but yeah, then it also really helped me to understand the brain right through to today. I'm still kind of working on consciousness. Um, and I feel like it gives me, I feel like it, it's very, it's a very clarifying perspective. Um, another aspect of it is you can understand these states as non-conceptual modes of consciousness where consciousness itself isn't, it's just awareness. It's not made of concepts, but within that awareness, we get concepts like cup, table, hand. We, we chunk our world into these, these categories. Um, and self and other, right? Self and environment, that's one of the most fundamental ones. Um, and in that conceptual mode, that's where we suffer. If you get rid of those concepts, you that's when you, you no longer suffer. Um, but it also, when you've seen that reality itself is beyond what you say about it, it's beyond concepts, it's beyond description, it just, it just is. And then everything, all our scientific models, all of our theories, they're all just descriptions, they're maps of the territory, they're not the territory itself. Um, when you when you've seen that it gives you a, a kind of a, a kind of deeper insight into the kind of philosophy of science it allows you to really um not take your models too seriously a lot of scientists and philosophers who haven't had these experiences make the mistake of getting confused between the model and the thing in itself that they're studying um but i feel like it's helped me in that sense to not not make that confusion uh so yeah i mean it, i would say it offers a broad perspective in which everything, everything that I, I kind of think and believe is framed by this perspective, I would say. Yeah, I like the way you think about science as creating maps and just improving upon those maps rather than this reductionist science that we're seeing a lot of now. And I'm curious how we can use those maps practically, how someone who's listening to this who's now maybe for the first time understanding this perspective of the way the mind works and how consciousness works and how can that inform, you know, their day-to-day -day life or what tools they might use to improve their experience of life. Right. I mean, the most fundamental thing would be 
to attempt to kind of have this non-dual insight. So that's a term that's used a lot for this non-dual in the sense that duality, you know, coming from two, the, the core duality is is one of self and other, self and world. Um, and when when you no longer feel there's a division there and you just feel like everything in your experience is unitive or, you know, no longer split in two, that's what we're, we're you know, non-dual refers to. Uh, it's interesting as well, the history of the, it comes from a kind of ancient Hindu tradition called Advaita, which means non-dual. Um, and it's, there's a reason they call it that. It's, it's because I was saying before how this state is beyond concepts. It's, it's kind of where you're just reckoning with reality as it is um, and no longer labeling it or describing it. So in that state, if you said, well, it's one, it's oneness, you're still using a concept. Um, so that's partly why there's, it's phrased in this negative way as in it's not two, it's no longer divided, um, which is quite a nice subtlety uh, to it. Um, so that's why we, we use this term. But so if you can have this insight, this non-dual insight, um, you know, it, it also actually, there are kind of two aspects to it. You can have this, this realization within consciousness that you and your, you know, your, your image of yourself is just an image, like everything else is an image. But there's also a parallel with that, which is that I was describing earlier how we are a thermodynamic process. We are a ripple in reality. We're like a wave in the ocean. Um, and this is speaking scientifically, but it's also, you know, one of these kind of spiritual insights. Um, from, you know, from that perspective, you can realize that physically we're also not divided. We're not truly divided. We behave in such a way for, for a period of time that we try to differentiate ourselves from our environment but we come from the same, you know, the same materials, uh, you know, this famous thing that we're, you know, the calcium in our bones was cooked up in exploding stars, that kind of thing. And, you know, when we die, we'll go back into the environment and who knows if my you know, molecules will be part of a tree or whatever. Um, so it's truly, it's reality is really non-dual on the physical level, but also, and also at the mental level. And those two things are kind of related. Um, but so the, the core thing, would be to attempt to have this insight and the traditional way to do it would be through meditation um psychedelics offer, also offer a way to uh to have these insights these days so there are retreats people can go on uh where you know something like psilocybin mushrooms you know there are tr retreats in like jamaica and netherlands legal ones where you can you can have the kind of these mushroom experiences and if you go into it and you meditate you're just kind of basically mindful you're just aware of whatever arises in consciousness you can feel your sense of self unraveling and you can have this, these profound insights. Um, and then it's, it's very, in your day-to-day -day life, it's an incredibly powerful tool to have. It allows you to kind of immediately cut through suffering. Um, and I'm talking about everything from kind of, you know, even something like depression, it can give you some relief for periods of time when you shift into this non-dual state. And suddenly you realize that consciousness itself isn't depressed. Uh, there's a there's an image of a depressed human within your consciousness, but you have this kind of distance from it. Now, if you just do that, that's slightly dissociative. That's slightly um, it's like a kind of coping mechanism. You're you're instead of addressing whatever the emotional issues are that gave rise to the depression, you're you're kind of just trying to come up with a way out. In some instances, there's no problem with that. You can you can use it as a uh, you know as a way to avoid suffering if you stub your toe even you can if you know how to shift into these states you can you can do so and the pain is now because it's this kind of mode of acceptance and non-attachment the pain is now just vivid it's not negative it loses its valence you know the scientific term for kind of whether it's positive or negative um and it's just intense i had a meditation retreat where i had this excruciating hip pain on like day nine or whatever it was um and I was, I was in this really kind of deep meditative state and it was just, it was like a kind of Kandinsky painting or something, just this really vivid, colorful experience that I was really enjoying being with until the bell rang. And then in that moment when my mind was like, okay, meditation's over. And then it just, this it became this um, incredibly unpleasant searing pain. Um, the moment my mind got distracted. So you, you really can, um, you can use meditation, which is, you know, the broader context of understanding this non-dual stuff to, to transcend suffering. Uh, I, I'm a big advocate alongside this stuff. You know, there's, there's this concept of something called spiritual bypassing, which is using techniques like meditation to just transcend the suffering. 
I'm a big fan of, of actively working on kind of psychotherapeutic stuff and increasing one's emotional health to address whatever the, the stuff is in your history that's given rise to suffering in the first place uh, alongside this, this framing. But I think the non-dual perspective always is useful for framing this stuff. Um, and it also allows you to, to kind of get the basic benefits of, of meditation where you're, you know, basic mindfulness where you, you want to be less um, lost in thoughts. You want to be just more aware, more aligned with what's genuinely arising in your experience. Um, and once you've, once you've had the, a taste of this non-dual experience, you realize just how incredibly profound these states can get. You know, the average person who dabbles in meditation, they might say, okay, I, I felt a bit bored. I felt a bit relaxed. It was kind of interesting for a moment, but nothing much happened. Um, when you have these full blown non-dual experiences, you really see that there's, there's nothing, there's literally nothing in reality that could be more profound, I think, than these experiences. Um, and that's why a lot of people, you know, take the psychedelic shortcut and I, you know, shortcuts aren't necessarily a bad thing. Um, I think psychedelics would probably be very useful. You know, I think if, if wider culture had a good understanding of this non-duality stuff, um, and integrated it into its implications into the way we live, I think that would be one of the best things possible for our culture. So that's partly why I'm an advocate for psychedelics to, as a way where their intentional use can help people get these kinds of insights, but also help heal traumas and whatever the emotional issues are that people have. Uh, but yeah, I would say in the first instance, transcending suffering is the main, the main benefit. Yeah. And really at, at the base level, what we're all after when we boil down any of our decisions, that's, you know, we're trying to get away from suffering. And I guess the other use of psychedelics, a lot of your writings and research are about psychedelics is that you can dependably, you can dependably replicate this non-dual experience that you've been describing. Whereas on a meditation retreat, it might come spontaneously uh, after many hours of diligent uh, practice you can just give someone a dose of this stuff and study their brain so i'm curious what do we know about this ego death experience or, or some of the ways that psychedelics interacts with the brain um, to produce that way of seeing the world right yeah so the when you look at a brain and you see the kind of wrinkly outer surface that's called the cortex um that's the kind of the main area that i study and um, that's the kind of, I mean, the cortex is involved in so many different functions from hearing to seeing to uh, decision making. Most of the stuff that makes we think of making us us kind of comes from the cortex. And fascinatingly, it's, it's got a pretty repeatable kind of circuit structure. So pe many people think that there might be some kind of algorithm in there that's like that needs to be cracked. That will be the, the kind of the key to understanding intelligence, which is kind of interesting. Um, but so when you take a psychedelic it acts on what are called serotonin receptors so brain cells have these these kind of lock and key mechanisms where chemicals floating around in the brain can lock into these these receptors on the surface of the cell and cause a bunch of activity to happen in them activate different pathways different neurons have neurons of brain cells different ones have uh, different receptors and so you get some that's sensitive to serotonin dopamine all these different different systems um and in humans, there's a lot of uh, the serotonin 2A receptor, which is just a, a label that was given to the one that psychedelics act on, the main one. Uh, there's a lot of them in the visual cortex where your, your kind of optic nerve projects to ultimately. And there are a lot in, in these kind of higher order areas uh, that are to do with your sense of self. So what we know is that when when you have psychedelics in the brain and they connect with these receptors, they do something to the circuitry that if you take perception, if you take, you know, the way that I'm experiencing the world now, I was saying at the start that we tend to feel like we're seeing out of this kind of windows of our eyes onto an objective world. If I were to take a psychedelic right now at a high enough dose, what I would see is that all of this stuff that seems objective and solid and that I'm just seeing it as it is, it would suddenly start to distort and change into patterns. Maybe I'd get hallucinations. And you can very quickly realize that our impression of reality, you know, I'm not talking about reality itself. There is something out there, you know, the physical world, but the, the impression of it, the way that I see it is really a mental construct. You know, we, we often use this term controlled hallucination in neuroscience for 
how we perceive the world. It's like a dream that your your brain is generating, but it's it's checked against sensory evidence so that you um, you can navigate the world. And then psychedelics seem to be doing something to change how tightly we hold on to our models of the world. So in order to survive, we need to constantly be guessing what's going to happen next in our sensory input. Um, you know, like as you move your head, I, my brain is unconsciously predicting what it's going to look like moment to moment. If it suddenly looked different, if you had a nose that suddenly appeared behind your ear, I would be surprised and I would, need, I would pay attention and I'd be like, okay, my models aren't working. Uh, I need to update them. Uh, and that's how we how we survive. So this is a kind of predictive processing framework of understanding the brain. Um, but so with psychedelics, you you hold on to your models less tightly, and that's where you get this kind of distortions, hallucinations. The the brain is guessing more. So you might you might be looking at a tree trunk, but instead of saying, "Well, that's a tree trunk," your brain is saying, "Well, I don't know. Is it scales of a reptile? Is it is it faces? Is it a dog's you know dog's face?" Uh, is it fur? And so you you have these kind of shifting hallucinatory patterns. Um, and then if you, you know, the brain is thought to be organized in a kind of hierarchical way where you have this low level guesses happening in the brain, but higher up, you, you know, the information gets kind of passed forward, forward, forward to this kind of frontal part of the brain. And at the kind of top of the hierarchy, there's a kind of constellation of brain areas that's usually called the default mode network. And that's because it was... It was found because basically people, neuroscientists were putting people in brain scanners. And what you tend to do is if I'm interested in say, I don't know, hearing, I would take a scan during silence. Then I would take a scan during, you know, you listening to something. And then I would look at the difference. Well, usually you're measuring difference in blood flow because blood flow delivers oxygen to the neurons and glucose for them to be active as a kind of proxy for activity. Um, but then eventually someone had the smart idea of saying, well, what is this baseline? What is the kind of standard brain activity when someone's just sitting in a, in a brain scan and mind wandering? And they found this constellation of areas called the default mode network because it's your, your default mode. So it's like if you're sitting on the bus and you're thinking about what you did yesterday, you're thinking, oh, I need to go get milk or whatever, you know, thinking about the future, worrying about stuff to do with yourself. Most of our mind wandering is self-referential. It's like, what did I do? What do I need to do? People who relate to me. Um, and it's in this mode that we weave together our complex sense of self. Um, and so this, this network, the default mode network is, is doing this. Um, and it has these, these kind of high level guesses that can override uh, the kind of lower level guesses that circuits and things like the visual cortex are doing. So um, if, if I knew that you uh, were wearing a mask on the back of your head, if I kind of, you told me that, then you turn around and I see a nose behind your ear, I'm no longer surprised because I have these high level models that can overwrite the lower level ones. So with a psychedelic, there's a, you know, there's a lot of these serotonin 2A receptors in the default mode network as well. So it seems to disrupt activity there and reduce activity. So you're basically impairing your ability to weave together a sense of self, weave together your best guesses of, of the world. Um, and there are some people who think that it's, it's, the, it's the toppling of that the, the parts of the brain that rule on top of the hierarchy that really lets the rest of the brain go crazy and do all these hallucinations. Um, I'm open to the idea that it may just be the local activity and visual cortex, but that's a different thing. Um, so this is why you're, you're just kind of toggling brain activity in the, this part of the brain that your, you know, meditators also showed reduced default mode network activity. So if you get someone to pay attention to their breath and not indulge in distracting thoughts, and just whenever their mind wanders, just come back to the sensation of breathing, it will have a similar effect. They'll, if they actually can do that, they will gradually think, they'll gradually think about the future less, gradually thinking about the past less, more, more, their, their awareness is more kind of coincident with what's truly happening, whether it's the sensation of the breath or whatever's appearing. And again, this brings us full circle to my experience as a teenager. We spoke about the kind of your thoughts of the future falling away, the thoughts of the past falling away, and suddenly you're just here. Um, and then if you're here enough, if you're present enough, the you disappears and there's just, there's just is, there's just existence being whatever you want to, whatever label you want to put on it. But in this state, there is no label. There's just like, it's like being a wave in the ocean who's obsessed with being a separate wave and suddenly giving up on that obsession and realizing you're just part of this overall process and being okay with that and finding, finding freedom from your oppressive psychology of being the wave, um, when you when you let go in that way 
Yeah, and it's a beautiful analogy. I'm curious just hearing you talk about these substances. So I know a lot of people who take psychedelics more recreationally. They're kind of experienced junkies. And there's also people who have been on the meditation path for a very long time and have maybe had glimpses of this non-dual experience, but they I know people who spent decades and they've never really felt like they've stabilized that or might even feel like they wasted a lot of time on the cushion. So what's your vision of how these psychedelics, meditation, or other tools might be used in the future to actually create a more dependably uh, kind of, I guess, stabilized version of that? Or I don't know what, what, we, what we, we might call it, but it's just clear to me that we need the science to inform a better use of these tools as they're being taken out of traditions that may or may not have dependably gotten people there, uh, probably evolved through cultural evolution and might not have been perfectly efficient either. So how do we then put them, put those pieces together in the modern world to help more people live that way? Right. Yeah. I think, I think that's a really interesting point because, you know, I, um, I find a lot of, when I, when I think about, you know, uh, our current social situation, um, and the, the kind of the suffering that occurs in the world, I find it very clarifying to go back 10,000 years, which is not very long in human history to before the advent of agriculture and look at how we think hunter gatherer humans lived for the vast majority of human existence, like 95%. Um, and to me, it seems, I find that very clarifying that, that as you, you mentioned, kind of processes of natural cultural evolution, it seems very plausible to me that, that before agriculture, before our separation from nature and our attempt to dominate it and technology, civilization, it seems very likely that we were similar to other animals and that we lived in a kind of instinctive evolutionary kind of balance with nature in a way where there was less discord, more, more harmony. And, you know, obviously there's still famines and uh, bad things happening and death still happens, but I think that, that we wouldn't have had the kind of mental health crises and things like that, that we, we see today, but we are where we are. And the kind of things you and I are talking about, effectively what we're doing is we're trying to come up with some fix, some solution, something that will help people um, to perhaps re-engage with, with healthy ways of being in the world that could look like those ancient ways of being. But we're, yeah, we're trying to, set a course intentionally. We're not just trying to function by instinctive evolution now. Um, and so that's where science, I think, can be incredibly powerful because what we don't want is um, people just doing things on blind faith or, you know, because that's where you get pathological personality types, gurus who, you know, abusive uh, leaders and things who are just like, follow my you know, program and it'll all be fine. Um, so I think that's why it's, it's wonderful to exist in a time where science is coming together with meditation and psychedelics to, to use evidence, just to really figure out how do we, um, how do we come up with an evidence base that can help people to access this stuff? Um, you know, with the clinical work, most people don't feel, you know, when you're going into an altered state, it's inherently, you're inherently going out of the ordinary, you're stepping into the unknown. And that's kind of inherently scary for most people. So having a kind of a scientist or a clinician or someone who can tell you, look, here's the, here's the data that shows it's safe. We know what we're doing. We have models for how to contain and approach this. I think that's really, really necessary. Um, in addition to that, you know, I think sciences can be stuck in its own very conservative worldview of how it moves forward with this stuff. So we also need culture change that's a bit more, uh, that provides a framework within which we can, we can interpret this stuff. Um, which is partly what I'm kind of trying to do when I, you know, describe how I think this stuff fits with our naturalistic understanding of the world. And what, so that's my contribution. I'm hoping it will help more and more people access this stuff because even though I'd had this experience as a teenager, as someone who had been, um, I would say emotionally wronged by organized religion at a young age, I was, you know, skepticism is what helped me keep you know, and continues to, to keep me safe from just believing people's outlandish claims. So when I, you know, even though I have spirituality, I use it because it's the term that is associated with things like meditation and um, 
but I still am uncomfortable with the the fact that it's often used in ways that are kind of supernatural and untied from from not just from evidence but from a kind of cohesive worldview that hangs together well. That's what I'm aiming for. It's something where you don't have to give up on science, you don't have to give up on philosophy. It all hangs together. Um, there are a lot of people who take psychedelics and then say science is science is a con. It's all nonsense. We're the mind of God. Forget science. You know, I'm, and I'm not one of those people. Um, and I don't think that attitude is going to, is going to kind of help us get the mainstream on board with with this stuff. Um, so yeah, I think science can really it can help us objectively choose optimal paths um, for how we unfold, how we kind of roll this stuff out, and it can also help us keep us safe, basically keep us grounded, keep, keep us from, you know, like a, a big, the human mind, like, likes to make meaning, it instinctively makes meaning. And so when you're thinking about these big questions of, you know, you have these profound experiences and what does it mean? You're naturally going to tend towards kind of narratives that feel like satisfying narratives that can be comprehended by the human mind. You know, I'm the mind of God and the universe is kind of, you know, it's all about God discovering itself. And th this, these are the kind of narratives that are quite common in the psychedelic and kind of spiritual space. Um, what's less in, what's less kind of instinctive is to say, is to take the kind of clinical cold scientific look and say, well, I actually don't see evidence of, of purpose. Reality seems to be kind of meaningless and absurd <laughs> in a way. But if you feel emotionally healthy enough, you know, if you, if you, if you're stressed out and anxious and have unhealed traumas, you might become a nihilist. You might say, oh, like I feel separate and scared and I don't like this. Um, but if you, if you feel kind of grounded and healthy enough, you can be left with a feeling of it being wonderful that, that life is meaningless, that it has no, no purpose. There's no kind of thing you need to be aiming for. Uh, it's just a kind of a playground for you to enjoy really. Yeah. Beautiful. I, I love the way you think about these topics and yeah, I couldn't agree more with the point about so many people will have an experience and then they'll attach a metaphysical woo woo nonsense description of how that, you know, uh, ontological claims about the way the universe works or something. And I think that's what turns a lot of people off from, you know, these replicable, life-changing um, experiences like what you had. And, and so I think you're, you're doing the good work that's going to get it to more of a mainstream and also just a more rational uh, protocol and, and way of understanding it. And yeah, I just have a few rapid fire questions for you at the end here. Are you ready for the rapid fires? Yeah, yeah. Bring them on. All right. So if you could have dinner with anyone living or dead, who would it be and why? Have dinner with anyone living or dead? Great question. I'm, I'm surprised I don't have an answer for that. They're kind of ready to go. I might say Spinoza, um, who's kind of a philosopher that I feel his worldview fits quite nicely with my own. It's kind of naturalistic, but also is infused with this kind of sense of awe at nature. Um, yeah, he... Um, I also have a, a strange family connection to Spinoza where my 12th great grandfather excommunicated him from, uh, from Judaism for being an atheist, um, uh, which is my only claim to fame. That's not why I chose him, <laughs> but you'd tell him, sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but then the only other people maybe would be someone like Alan Watts, some kind of these 20th century spiritual thinkers who I, I feel kind, kind of aligned with. Nice. And then what's a specific research area that you're most excited about right now? Um, so in my own work, it's uh, kind of understanding where consciousness comes into existence. And my whole perspective is that the life process is only made possible by consciousness. You, you need to be conscious. Like the activity of being alive brings consciousness into existence. Um, because you can't survive if you don't build up a model of what's going on around you, basically. Um, so I, I find that 
for me, that has big implications again for how we live our life. Because if you see all of nature as conscious and you are, and you think that's a scientifically justifiable position, it suddenly brings us into you realize that we are part of nature. We don't have dominion over it, and that we need to respect it more. So there's a whole grant, there's a whole kind of range of interesting things going on now in kind of plant intelligence and um, and I, I think you know to to the mainstream this sounds could just sound kind of silly to you know be like oh what well, my plants kind of aware but you know we're not talking about it has it having thoughts like we do but just that there's some feeling tone to it you know as it as it seeks out nutrients and navigates the world turns towards light um i genuinely believe that 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 makes most sense and that there are there are kind of reasons why there's a thing called the hard problem of consciousness which kind of comes in you if you insist that some life forms aren't conscious then you face this problem of saying, well, why is it that they can see and can have memory and can do all this stuff, but they're not conscious and consciousness becomes this kind of magical extra thing. I think it makes it more elegant to say that um, all life is conscious. So that whole area of, of understanding how we are the same as all other natural processes, obviously different in some ways, but that we're not as different as we think. Um, they're not like just these objects that we live amongst. They're really alive and um, intelligent. That's probably what I'm most interested in. Hmm. So kind of this Thomas Nagel idea, what is it like to be a bat? Well, if there's a flow of information running through a plant similar to us keeping it alive, then it probably is feels like something to be a plant. Is that part of the idea? Right. And we, we, we wouldn't necessarily know exactly what that feels like, but just that it's not like a rock. It's not like something that has no inner world. But that, yeah, like if you take a... Um, you just take a, a single celled organism moving towards the light and moving away from chemicals that will be destructive to it. It's sensing, it's reacting, it's building up models of its world. I think it has some feeling tone to, to that. And are you in general agreement with Hoffman's like multimodal user interface theory of consciousness? So I, I like, I, I also would describe consciousness as a kind of user interface in the sense of like, it's like a simulation generated by the organism that we use to navigate the world. That's a useful way to talk about what we were talking about earlier, where, you know, your image of yourself is just this image that appears in the simulation. There is a body as well, but it helps you navigate the world to have these, these symbols. Um, I'm also in agreement with him that the structure of consciousness maps onto what he calls fitness payoffs or, you know, kind of the structure of the world that's relevant for survival. Um, you know, f rotting food tastes bad to us because it's not good for our survival, but it probably tastes good to maggots that that want to eat it and it's good for its survival. So feelings like that map onto fitness payoffs. But then his whole, his his theory is, is really quite out there after that. That's the similarities. And, you know, with my, with my theory, mine is the kind of mainstream scientific perspective that I'm a physical organism and I have a mind. His is the everything is consciousness there are these conscious agents that that all reality is interacting conscious agents and i interviewed him for my podcast and was asked the, the one thing i still can't get my head around is what's the difference between you as a cluster of these conscious agents that also is conscious as well as being made of conscious agents and a rock that is made of conscious agents but it's not itself conscious he, t he said that it was like that we are like portals to these other conscious agents. I don't know. It, it, it doesn't click for me that, that final bit, but the, the first two bits really do. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I realized I opened a can of worms right at the end here. So we <laughs> realized there were supposed to be rapid fire, but if folks are interested, it's called the living mirror theory of consciousness, your theory. And if they want to Google that and read more about it, uh, you know, would love to, have another hour to get into some of that stuff. But uh, the final question that I ask every guest is you have this 15 second commercial with a message you'd like everyone in the world to uh, live by or, or hear, uh, what would you say in that commercial? That's a great question. Um, it would be that we are truly part of nature in the way I was, I was just saying. And that reality is truly undivided. And that if you discover that for yourself and feel it to be true and live in a way that's aligned with those two truths, which are themselves related, you know, we're not truly separate from nature. Um, 
if you can live in alignment with that, that will moving in that direction solves. I'm tempted to say all the <laughs> all the problems we face. If if we can live more and more in alignment with that, it's kind of by definition brings us into harmony. Um, at the individual level, there's less suffering. At the social level, you you know you're not going to chop off your right hand isn't going to chop off your left hand when you think it's part of the same thing. So when we see each other as part of the same thing, we we're, we're less inclined to harm each other. Um, so for me, that's the fundamental axis we need to be moving on as a society. Uh, yeah. Love it. Wonderful. Well, I guess finally, where can folks learn more about your work, uh, connect with you? You've got a podcast, so please plug your, your stuff now. <laughs> yeah. So you can drjamescook.com with an E on the end on cook. Uh, I, t- I try to have everything on there because I, I kind of do some writing a lot of the time for realitysandwich.com. Um, I put the articles there. Uh, my YouTube channel, uh, you can also find just Dr. James Cook on YouTube. Uh, the podcast is called Living Mirrors with Dr. James Cook, kind of reference to the theory. Um, I'm at Dr. James Cook on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Uh, and yeah, on, on the website, you can find my original Living Mirrors paper. I also have a paper coming out this year in the journal Entropy on differentiating my perspective from another kind of leading theory of consciousness called integrated information theory. Um, so that'll be out later this year and I'll, I'll put a link to it on the, on the website as well. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Great. Well, thanks so much for sharing all this with us today and, uh, and taking the time to come on the podcast. It's been really fun. Yeah, it's been great. Thanks a lot, Liam.